Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone tonight for Queen City Crime. I'm David Siders. I'm a longtime uh, Ohioana Board of Trustee member, and I work with the, public the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library. Yes, we have a new name for our library. So it's great to collaborate with the Ohioana Library Association and the Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library to bring you Queen City Crime tonight. It's a pleasure to welcome our authors, Janice Heisel and Bob Batchelor. Um, and I'll uh, share their biographies with you in just a moment, but we really want to honor and celebrate the 2020 Ohioana Book Festival. Since its inception in 2007, the Ohioana Book Festival has given readers the opportunity con to connect with their favorite Ohio writers. And as well, we're all experiencing a new world with the pandemic, it's absolutely fabulous that the 2020 Book Festival will be held virtually starting next Friday, August 28th to Sunday, August 30th. It's free, of course, and open to the public with no registration free, uh, beforehand. And I believe Cor uh, Morgan from Ohio Anna Library will place the link to the book festival schedule in our Q&A section tonight. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping things. Um, we're looking at a, a level of Zoom that has a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen there and a chat feature. So I understand the difference is when you have questions for our authors tonight, please place them in the Q&A section. That'll allow uh, all of us to see the questions. Chat would only go to um, kind of behind the scenes and our authors and, uh, and me, but we'd like to, for the questions to be uh, apparent to all. So let's get started. I'm really excited to learn more about our authors and their really wonderful books here for Queen City Crime. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from Janice and her book Submerged, Ryan Widmer, His Drowned Bride, and the Justice System, and Bob's book The Bourbon King, The Life and Crimes of George Remus, Prohibition's Evil Genius. Janice established herself as a bulldog news reporter with a heart during more than two decades as a professional journalist. She would fight, scratch, and claw for public records, yet wrote tragic stories with a soft touch. After more than two decades as a full-time writer for daily newspapers, Janice became a freelance writer. She spent 18 months writing and researching her first book, Submerged. As a writer for the Cincinnati Enquirer, Janice covered every aspect of the Widmer bathtub drowning case through three spellbinding trials. Unanswered questions compelled her to write Submerged in time for the 10th anniversary of the case in August 2018. The book's editor was her former, former Enquirer colleague, Peter Bronson, who also wrote the introduction and helped Janice publish the work through his company, Chili Dog Press. During her 15 years at the Enquirer, Janice earned awards from the Society of Professional Journalists and from the Press Club of Cleveland. Her award-winning work include, included articles on teen driving safety, political campaign contribution, contributions, personality profiles, breaking news, investigative database projects, and the Widmer case. Janice also became the first Enquirer reporter to do stand-up video news reports for the Enquirer's website, Cincinnati.com. Bob um, informs us that comic books turned him, him into a reader and created the, his need to write. His love for history grew as he encountered a series of great teachers who fostered a love for the topic. Fast forward to the present, Bob is a cultural historian and biographer. In his career, he's written or edited 29 books on contemporary American culture, including Mad Men, A Cultural History, John Updike, A Critical Biography, and Gatsby, The Cultural History of the Great American Novel. Though he spent most of his time researching, writing, and editing books, he's also published quite a bit in journals and in anthologies, including Radical History Review, The Journal of American Culture, The Mailer Review, the American Prospect Online, the John Updike Review, and Public Relations Review, as well as dozens of essays in books and monographs. So let's get started. 
Uh, I'd like to ask each of you, and let's start with you, Janice. Um, what made you inspired to follow your illustrious figures and write a book, in your case, the Widmer case, and then next with Bob, George Remus? Well, it was actually um, one of the main things was that I think that this case just gripped people's hearts and baffled their minds. And people were still talking about it even after it went to trial, not once, not twice, but three times. And I think that part of the appeal of the case for people is that this couple was just your ordinary kind of like boy and girl next door. Um, there was no history of any violence. And then suddenly, boom, they're just propelled into this she's dead and he's being prosecuted for murder and no one saw any of this coming. Um, so I think that people could imagine themselves or know, see people that they know being in one of these roles or maybe somebody identifies with, you know, Ryan Withermer's mother and can only imagine what it's like to have your son charged with murder and you believe fervently that he did not do this, has no history of any violent behavior at all. And then maybe other people, you know, identify with Sarah's family. So there were, you know, it's this little suburban couple only married four months. And that's the other thing. There's such a mystery, you know, only married four months and then this happens. Um, and then on a more personal level, I actually live down the road from where all this happened. And literally right now where I'm sitting, I can probably a mile from where I'm sitting is, is where all of this occurred. And so constantly driving past different scenes, so to speak, that played a role in this case, kept it on my mind. And also, the unanswered questions. I, I've always been, you know, one of the things that drove me even as a little kid and then, you know, as a journalist was I, I really love digging for the answers. And I felt like that even though this case went to trial three times, a lot of the answers still weren't there. And that's the short version of what compelled me to write the book. Uh, for me, with... Yeah, for me with George Remus, uh, this has been kind of a semi-obsession for about 18 years. I was asked to write a short entry for a reference book. And so some of the younger uh, people on the um, viewing list right now might not remember, but there are actually reference books once created before we had the internet. And a very famous historian asked me to write an article on bootlegging. And I didn't know that much about bootlegging. I was just considered somebody who knew a lot about early 20th century America. When I started the research, I ran across this figure named George Remus. And at the time, there wasn't much on him. The information was pretty scant. But I included him in the essay, and he stuck in my mind like a, an earworm, like a bad song from the 1980s or something like, a I don't know, an Aerosmith or an Air Supply song. And I couldn't get Remus out of my mind. And so as the, the 100th year anniversary of Prohibition came around, I find myself living in Cincinnati. I'm in Remus's backyard. And nobody knows about this guy. I mean, even in Cincinnati, I started asking people, what do you know about George Remus? And, and they were like, Remus who? So people had seen him in Boardwalk Empire. And that was a cartoonish totally BS perspective of who Remus was. A little bit had been done on the uh, Ken Burns Prohibition documentary. I wanted to find out who the real person was. And coming off the, the biography that I had done before this, I did Stan Lee, who was a co-creator of the Marvel Universe. And that was a big topic that a lot of people were interested in. So when I had the opportunity to do another book, I just gravitated to Remus because I thought this is a person who's been lost to history and people should know about him. You know, I'd like to interject something, Bob, and that is you use the word obsession and I kind of feel like that I have that in common. I think that most people who write a book about any topic, they are at least serially obsessing on, obsessing on that particular thing mm -hmm. because you have to have that passion for the subject matter or you won't be able to dedicate yourself to do the really hard work that's required to give birth to a book, as I put it. Yeah, I was talking just two nights ago with the um, 
with Peter and Bo Pogue, two of the owners of the Pogue Distillery in Maysville. It's the third distillery ever created in, in Kentucky. And it's, it's famous because it's not bourbon country. It's the other side. It's, it's Eastern Kentucky. And uh, Peter and Bo started asking me questions because their father or their grandfather had dealt directly with Remus. And we determined that somebody could take my book and probably write five or six other true crime books just on Remus and other people that I only had time to barely mention in the book. So the obsession part, I find myself still digging through newspapers because some question will spring in my mind. And I think, damn, there's got, got to be an answer here. I've got to find this answer. But uh, yeah, so obsessed is a great word. Yeah, I agree. And, and I'm still digging on different aspects of the Widmer case, too. So I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fascinating that, and thanks for sharing your, your obsessions and your drive, but it's fascinating that you both have a geographical closeness, you know, to it surrounding you. And then you meet people, I'm sure, that ask questions all the time. And in your case, the Pogue family. Um, so that's fascinating that keeps kind of the questions coming and the stories alive and meaningful to people around you. So Bob, to your point about reference books, and we librarians still remember reference books and pulling <laughs> them off the shelf and using the index and other coding systems. Uh, tell us how about your research process. And then Janice, I'll ask you next because your firsthand witnessing of your story, um, I think might be a little bit different. So I think our viewers tonight might be interested in both of your processes and how they've been different. Uh, Bob, tell us how much digging did you have to do were you in the Cincinnati area? Were you elsewhere in Ohio with your work? Or um, how, how was that research process? So I am professionally trained as a historian. So what I like to do is do the professional historical work, the archival digging, but then present the book. I think of it, and if hopefully what readers have told me, it reads like the longest screenplay that you've ever read. So what that necessitates is deep digging and deep archival research. I was lucky, I was living here, so I could walk the grounds. Like, so where, where George killed Imogene in Eden Park, I've walked that, that path, I've seen everything, I've seen what used to be the Alms Hotel. I got access to places where Remus had been, um, even including uh, the nemesis of this book is Franklin Dodge, and his home, his boyhood home, has been turned into a museum in Lansing, Michigan. It's a home museum. So I was able to walk in his bedroom and walk the, the building where he grew up. So there's a lot of hands-on research, but then the digging, luckily, um, Yale University, because Charlie Taft went there, has one of the few transcripts of the complete trial, including the insanity hearings that Remus went through. So because I was um, affiliated with a, an academic institution, Yale let me um, borrow all those books. And it was about five to 7,000 pages of court transcripts. So when people read The Bourbon King, they think this all must be made up. You must have created this out of thin air. But the stories that I tell are things that come directly from the transcripts. And so that, luckily, Charlie Taft wasn't too proud to donate those transcripts to his alma mater. And 100 years later, somebody like, well, a little less than 100 years later, I could read those and then look at all the newspapers because every newspaper in America was covering the Remus trial. So I could look at all that. And I probably read 10 or 15,000 newspaper articles over a 10 year or 12 year span. So digging deep, that was one thing that was essential. And that's, that's the training that I have, um, ironically, from Kent State, where I trained with one of the greatest historians to ever live. And then I apply what I learned about being boots on the ground and walking the walk, kind of like uh, Bob Caro does with his great LBJ biographies. So that as a biographer, that's always in the back of my mind do the research and then present it in a way that people want to read. I don't want to create some dry, boring history. I want people to live in the moment. Yeah, and speaking of living in the moment, but also access to court transcripts, that is an interesting segue to Janice's uh, experience too. 
Um, tell us about, Janice, tell us about how you documented your work as you witnessed firsthand the development of the Widmer case along the way, including the mistrials. Um, and did you refer back to some of the court transcripts? Oh, most definitely. I was agreeing, sitting here nodding and agreeing with everything that Bob was saying. I'm not trained as a historian as he is. My training was history in a hurry, journalism, as we call it. Um, but I always had editors making fun of me because I wanted to write so long. And, and they say, what are you trying to do, Janice, write a book? Well, apparently, yes, I was. Um, so, um, with the Widmer case in specific, when this case first started happening, at first, nobody, nobody knew what to think. I mean, you have a young 24-year-old woman. She drowns in her bathtub. Um, then all of a sudden, the husband's charged with murder. There's no sign of any drugs. So, of course, he killed her, right? But then some things start to come up that make it a little unclear whether it's that clear cut. For example, she had... Um, problems with, you know, sudden bouts of sleepiness and things. So, um, and different other symptoms that people raise questions, you know, was there something going on with her? So here I am, I'm covering this case as it's developing in real time. And I actually kept a diary as well. Um, I don't know whether I thought that I might write a book someday, but I act, it was actually more of a thing of catharsis for me that it was an intense experience. Um, it was probably one of the most intense periods of my career for such a very long time because the case happened in 2008 and it wasn't all over in the court system until 2011 with trials and of course appeals are still going on right now and here we are in 2020. So it was very intense for me and I felt like I needed to decompress and write some things and as a writer people People will do that. You, you want to get out your feelings. And so I relied somewhat on that. Um, but I, I did feel, feel the need, just because I'm a completist, to reread, even though I was there for all three trials. I think I was the only reporter. There might have been one other TV reporter who was there for most days of the trial. But I think I'm the only one who was there for every single day of all three trials. And I don't know uh, I don't even know how to describe. I was so exhausted from this whole process emotionally and just the number of hours required. Um, so I did review, and just like you, Bob, my transcripts that I reviewed, 6,000 pages. So right in that same range of that you said 5,000 to 7,000, I'm right there in the sweet spot in the middle. Um, and I know that for a fact, just because the first trial was 1,000 pages, well, that's not too bad. 2,000 for the second trial and 3,000 for the third trial, all together at 6,000 pages. On top of that, I was um, able to persuade Ryan Widmer to have his attorneys give me all of their documents. He signed a waiver, turned it all over, 3,000 more pages. Then there was about a thousand pages I got from the police department. Those were just the police records. And I don't even know how many pages of personal documents. And Bob, you know what I mean by the um, primary sources, things such as diary entries of Ryan Widmer, hello. I was kind of like, wow, I felt like I hit pay dirt when I had the diary of Ryan Widmer in my hands. Um, and then also letters that people wrote to Ryan in prison and that he wrote back because he got out for a time when so, uh, after there was some jury misconduct discovered after the first trial. Um, and so a friend of his ended up in possession of all these documents. And again, with his permission, I ended up having all of that in my possession for a time and sat and read and had my entire living room floor covered with with court files and cards and letters and the Ryan Widmer diary and everything all over the floor. So um, on top of it, I also had a lot of media. You were talking, Bob, about reading the news articles. I reread all of my articles. I looked up all the articles I could find that other media wrote as well. And I also, there was a lot of things that were on um, YouTube. Um, different TV reports and, and things like that. And so I, I literally consumed and condensed all of that. And so I always joke and tell people, when you read my 310 page book, it condenses all that for you, yay. <laughs> so thank you. And I think the next question is um, good timing for you, Janice. And then Bob, uh, what surprised you as you, uh, what surprised you about your subjects as you learned more about them, especially over time and reflection? 
Do you want to go first, Bob, or you want me to go first? No, go go ahead, Chance. Oh, I'm and on a roll. You have the diary, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, when I read the diary, um, it, it was an interesting feeling to have his diary because even though it was with his permission. I felt a little intrusive, you know, um, this is a person's personal diary and they are not, when at the time it's written, they're not expecting that anyone else is ever going to see it. And so you feel a little intrusive about that. But then the curiosity aspect, I just devoured it. I couldn't help it. I was reading, reading and looking for some insights. And um, the thing that was very poignant for me as I read the diary that was surprising was that the number of times that he just expressed missing Sarah and trying to figure out what was happening. He kept saying, why is this happening? Why is this happening? That was in his own diary over and over. And see, you know, some people really believe this guy did it and was just justly convicted. But when you read this diary, you start to ask, you know, he had no way of knowing that I or anyone else would ever see this diary. Why would you write? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? So it, it, that that is one aspect of, of Ryan Widmer that I, I had unique insight because of that diary. Another thing, and I feel a little guilty about this as a media person. I think we've all seen situations where the media will seize upon something and the public perception that is created as a result of media coverage is very different than the person in real life. And that is actually what happened here. Now, as a media person, I can tell you sometimes that happens because you are not being given the whole story. For example, if I try to interview the family members of Ryan Widmer and they're not cooperating, I'm not getting their story. And then if somebody who hates Ryan Widmer talks to me, I'm sure getting that story. Um, so you're very limited based on, you can't force anyone to talk to you. So you're kind of limited in that way. But I did find that there was a perception of Ryan after he got out um, on bond, he ends up hooking up with some woman and gets her pregnant, yikes. And um, people thought he was like a Casanova or some smooth operator. As I got to know Ryan through personal visits and um, talking to friends, people who knew him, he is the furthest thing from that, in my opinion. Um, he, you know, when I described, you know, what were you thinking? He turned five shades of red, <laughs> kind of a little bit awkward socially, a little bit around women from what I've been told. Um, so again, that was really interesting because a lot of people in the public had this perception of him that he was probably cheating on his wife and, and, and I didn't get that vibe that he thinks he's God's gift to women at all. Nothing like that. So it was very interesting to see the public perception of Ryan Woodmer versus my perception and then the perception of people who knew him. Yeah, so I think uh, the thing that probably surprised me the most about George Remus going off what Janice is saying is that he was a masterful media manipulator and he was such a charismatic person on the front page of the Chicago Tribune when Remus was a famous lawyer. He was really like the Johnny Cochran of early 1900s uh, America. He was even more famous than Johnny Cochran. Um, they said uh, George Remus with the moonbeam smile. So here was this person that was this vicious murderer, but he was also incredibly char charismatic. And he would manipulate the media. He would bring reporters to his mansion in Price Hill, and he would wine them and dine them, and then they would tell the story that Remus wanted to tell them. So he became not only because he was generous to poor people, but also because he manipulated the media he was seen almost as a folk hero. And so no matter what he did, people responded to him in a really positive way. Uh, even considering in, in the late 1928, if you murdered your wife and she was having an affair, people thought that you were just uh, protecting your house and that it was okay, which is so ludicrous to us now when we think 
but Remus, uh, this guy was brilliant, but he was also uh, the worst murderer and worst thug that you can imagine. So it's one of the reasons why the Boardwalk Empire uh, piece that I mentioned earlier, they treated him like the comic relief of that television show when actually Remus would have been the most powerful person in that room. And the other men in those, that room, even though they were murderers and thugs as well, would have been f uh, afraid of him. So the Remus character, there are still layers and layers there that the, the public doesn't understand, but he was really a, a genius at what he did. And that's why we added the, the evil genius tag to the subtitle because it, it, it belongs there. Um, people loved him. Uh, people ask me, would I like to have a beer or a drink of bourbon with George Remus if he were alive today? I say, me and anybody else you know, we would have crossed the street and run the other way. You would not want to be around this guy. He was a thug. And if you looked at him the wrong way, he might beat you to a pulp. So I'm surprised every, every time I think about George Remus, there's something new that comes out of it. That's what surprised me the most about him as a character. And the supporting cast is just right out of the 1920s. Uh, it could have been a gangster film. Um, so there are a lot of interesting characters in the book, even people that you think are bad, people you think are good or maybe not so good. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting study in human nature. You know, Bob, I think it's great that you pointed out that um, for example, if, if your wife were having an affair, you would have been justified to go after her, so to speak. But um, history, of course, you know, happens in context. And so it is hard sometimes for people in today's society to look back at how things uh, were acceptable in a certain day. And, you know, maybe 10 years from now, something that's acceptable now won't be. So I think that was a yeah. great point that you raised. Thanks. I agree. So tell us more about public reaction at the time of the Widmer and Remus trials, as we've been kind of hearing scandalous. So Janice, do you want to tell us more? I, I remember 10 plus years ago, right? But I think let's have a refresh. What, what was the reaction in our communities and across the country or the world for that matter? Okay, well, when the Widmer case first happened, the first trial, he, the, the drowning of Sarah Widmer happened in 2008, August. In fact, it was just August 11th was the 12-year anniversary. Um, and so when the case goes to trial in 2009 and it ends with a conviction, because of the things that came out about Sarah Widmer's medical possible issues, and because there wasn't a smoking gun, so to speak, presented during the case, um, there was actually a pretty big public outcry. The Cincinnati Inquirer I, did a poll, and you know, it was not scientific by any means, it just a poll where readers could say, do you think that it, you know, this was a correct verdict when Ryan Woodmer was convicted? It was something like 80% said no, which is to me, amazingly unusual because most people are lock them up, throw away the key when, when somebody, you know, has been convicted of murder. And, and you know, th there was a, a definite sentiment that, hey, maybe this guy got a raw, raw deal. And so I, I also know that um, there was a, a man locally who established a Free Ryan Widmer website that was getting hits from all over the world. We're talking you know, Japan and China, and people got very interested in this case all over the place. And as a matter of fact, my book has sold a fair amount of copies in Australia. I have, don't know why, but <laughs> um, it's really interesting. I guess they're interested in the justice system and they Google that and that's part of my book's title. So, um, so that's trial one. And at the, after that public sentiment kind of came out very against the guilty verdict, then the prosecution came out with some additional information that wasn't allowed in the trial. And it was about some racy images found on the Widmer computer. And maybe this, this shows that Ryan was, you know, stepping out on his wife. But once again, it wasn't allowed because there was no proof that Sarah Widmer knew these images even existed. So that's trial one. Trial two, it's a hung jury. And people by this time were starting to go, oh my goodness, is this thing going to go on forever? So it goes to trial three and that's in 2011. 
finally it does end with a conviction. And by now, the, after that conviction, we then find out that he ended up having a baby out of wedlock and there's all these things and people are like, uh, by now a lot of people were like, lock him up and throw away the key. There still was a significant percentage of people who thought that maybe this was a wrongful conviction, but public support had definitely diminished significantly for him um, by that point. So um, it was it was the most amazing court case that I had seen in, in almost you know, over 20 years in the news business, just, just in terms of the public was really fascinated and debating this at the water cooler. And I would say with Remus, um, Remus was already famous before he murdered Imogene. So he drew uh, reporters from all over the country and uh, people lined up around the block. There were a thousand people that tried to get into the uh, courthouse and they had to give out tickets and people were trying to sell tickets when tickets weren't for sale and people were fighting to get in. I mean, this was at the time uh, one of the couple probably biggest court cases in the 1920s and would turn out to be one of the largest court cases and, and most sensationalized probably in the first half of the 20th century. There are newspaper reports from all over the country. There were um, newspapers and, and wire services that were sending um, journalists to cover this around the clock, multiple stories a day uh, from every single angle. So it, it Remus was arguably, I would say, after uh, Warren G. Harding and Babe Ruth, maybe the third most popular person or most known person of the 1920s, which makes it sad that most people today don't even know that he exists, even in the greater Cincinnati area, because this was a sensational crime story and it was covered all over the world. So, uh, can't be under understated how famous Remus became and how the Queen City became the center of the debate about prohibition for um, a, a couple months in, in late 1928 and then thereafter. So I have to ask after hearing this, what is the lasting legacy of your subjects? How will they be remembered in history or collective memory or in the media and now I'm thinking perhaps even probably in the uh, law profession of law because of some precedent setting here for both of your cases. Janice. Okay, so in thinking about that question, I, I do think that, in fact, I know that law schools have been looking at the Widmer case to see what can be learned from it. Um, because it's not every day that you have a case that goes to trial three times. Uh, a lot of people are still kind of baffled as to how that happened and some of the legal ins and outs and what, some of the very interesting things about it that bubbled to the surface, the influence of media because, because of Ryan Woodmer's case being publicized by Dateline NBC, there was a, a, an alleged witness who came forward that got involved in this case. And there was another woman who lived all the way across the country who was on the phone with him the night that, that, that the other woman claimed that he confessed. <laughs> and that wo the woman from Washington State through, debunked the, the, she's like, look, he wasn't upset when he spoke to me. And then six minutes later, he's supposedly crying and confessing murder and sounds drunk. So the jury told me they didn't believe the woman who alleged, she's from Iowa, that alleged that he confessed. So the media played a huge role in this case by the time it went to trial that third time. So I think that one of the legacies of this case is going to be that a, a case like this doesn't come along very often when it does they people tend to analyze it because there is so much there i also think that it is kind of in, burned into people's psyche if if you lived in the cincinnati area when this was all happening i think a lot of women 
kind of freak out about taking baths still to this day because um, they wonder whether they could become a Sarah Widmer. And a lot of men have told me, regardless of a bathtub or anything, if I came home and found my wife dead, I think I would just call 911 and throw the phone because I wouldn't want to be accused and have my 911 call dissected over and over to make it look like I'm guilty because I don't say the exact right things when I'm upset about finding my wife dead. So it's really burned into people's psyches around this area, I think, um, for, for those reasons. Um, and the other thing that is kind of a lasting legacy of this case, in my opinion, is that um, we may never really know what happened. Because ev even the jurors who convicted Ryan Whitmer were unable to tell me, or anybody else that I'm aware of, a, a scenario that fit all the known facts. Uh, they weren't able to explain how does an adult male hold down a woman in a bathtub and leave no knuckles, knees, or elbows skinned up. Her nose wasn't um, bruised or anything. There were some bruises, but those bruises were argued to be possibly resulting from the medical processes that were done when they, you know, had to move her throat to try to put a tube down the throat, things like that. So um, it was a fast, and I just think that that is one of the saddest legacies of this case is that we may never know what happened because there are a lot of things that I've had law enforcement people tell me that they should have investigated certain things and they didn't. There were tests that were, should have been done on Sarah Widmer that were not done. And in fact, that's part of what's being debated right now in the federal court is whether to release Sarah Widmer's DNA so that it can be tested for certain disorders that in these tests were never done. Um, and one last thing that I'm kind of thinking and hoping might happen as a result of the Widmer case, because of the jury misconduct, I think that there's a need for a jury referee. I think there needs to be someone in that jury room who keeps the jury on task because then we might not have had Widmer two and three if the jury referee had been in that and said, time out, folks, you can't go laying down on a carpet naked to see how long it takes a body to air dry. That's not scientific. You can't consider this and keep them on the task. Um, there's also a movement toward Conviction integrity units. A lot of people haven't heard of these, but there's one in Cuyahoga County and these units are actually attached to the prosecutor's offices. And when someone says, look, I am innocent, as Ryan Whitmer does, he claims he's innocent to this day, then they reinvestigate the case and see if there's any merit because the court system rules are so tight that trying to even introduce new evidence when most people would logically think it was legitimate is almost impossible, it seems, based on, I'm not a lawyer, but based on my rudimentary understanding of some of the appeals processes. I would say with Remus, um, one of the reasons that I wanted to write The Bourbon King was that we, here we are a hundred years later, and we can still learn so much from what was going on in the 1920s. And it's a litany of things that we can look at today. I mean, everything from the way state stores are set up and the way that we tax alcohol to the way that we've dealt with marijuana uh, implementation and non-implementation in society. Uh, certainly presidential corruption, which Remus was at the center of the Harding corruption. I mean, Harding made Trump look like a Girl Scout. So um, we're still learning from this a hundred years later. And so there are specific legal kind of precedents that Remus set and the, the kind of crazy actions that he did to get himself set free. Um, we'll never know if he actually bribed jurors, but there's fairly decent evidence that he did. But what I love about writing history and particularly for uh, popular audiences is what do we learn about these situations so much uh, later in our own history? We can, uh, you could read The Bourbon King and, and look around you today and say to yourself, wow, these are uh, a century later, we're still dealing with these same issues and the same kind of people. Um, Imogene was either a victim or a gold digger, depending on how you look. And we still deal with these issues today. Remus was either a hero to people who were just thirsty or he was a craven criminal uh, murderer. And 
these debates go on and on. And what I love about history is that it gives us as readers, as individuals, the ability to think critically about the world around us. It enables us to be better consumers and uh, of society and the, the, the foundational ideas that make us American. So a lot of things that we can still learn and, and that's one of the main reasons that I wanted to write The Bourbon King. And what I did, which a lot of historians don't do, I love the ending credits on movies like Animal House where they tell you what happened after. So <laughs> if you read The Bourbon King, you'll see what happened to each one of these characters. And I'm telling you, there are five or 10 more books people could write just on the characters that uh, emerged from the Remus uh, ring at that time. Emerged I I... instead of submerged. <laughs> yes, some I of them did. I think some <laughs> screenplays, po possibilities of screenplays here. <laughs> Thank you both for your deeply informed insights on this. It's really fascinating. Um, I have one final question, but as we move to the top of the eight o'clock hour, I do want to have time for questions and answers from our guests. So if you would start typing in, and I think it's okay to type in the chat or the Q&A, but if you're typing in chat, just make sure it goes to all attendees and panelists. So please start, um, and I see one came in, um, but please start typing your questions now for our authors as I ask this last question. Uh, what else would you like to share about your journey in writing your book? Um, I'll jump in. Uh, my journey, what I, what I can't believe and what readers tell me, they tell me two things. I can't believe this is real. They're like, you made this up, right? They'll, they whisper it to me. You, you made this up. And I'm like, no, this is all real. Second, what readers tell me universally is this, why isn't this on Netflix or Amazon Prime? Why am I not seeing this? So the journey that I'd like to take with Bourbon King is, I don't want to, he, George Remus is not a hero. He's a villain. He's an evil person. But the fact that we can learn so much about history and about current events by looking at the past, I would love to see this in a broader medium. I think that it deserves a, a movie or a television series. So what I would like to do is, is move in that direction and, and hope that I get some help along the way. And th there have been just some discussions along that angle. Um, going back to the original uh, beginning of our discussion, I am hoping genuinely that someday this obsession with George Remus in the 1920s somehow leaks out of my right ear or something because I spend way too much time obsessed with what Remus was up to and, and how I could ever find out these answers in an era in which they didn't really keep written records. So it's been um, a great journey. It's been fun. Um, but, you know, uh, it's t like all writers, it's time to move on to the next thing, but I'll never get this thing out of my head completely. Do you want me to jump in and answer sure, your question? Yeah. So um, you wanted to know what else might people like to know about the journey I've been on with this book. I feel kind of stupid that I naively hoped that I would solve the mystery. I kind of thought, you know, gee, I'm going to go ahead and dig through all these files. I'm not going to find anything new. Um, but actually, you would think after three trials, you would have found out everything. No. Um, the analogy that I came up with once is, you know, those Russian nesting dolls that they kind of, they start off big and then you open it and there's another one and it just kind of, it's kind of like one of those that goes to infinity and it sounds like that yours is like that too, Bob. Um, but I, I am actually to this day still learning new things about the Widmer case, especially about the medical aspect of it. Um, recently, I even had a doctor from Florida who saw the Widmer case on a rerun of Dateline, contacts me, told me about a syndrome that I still hadn't heard of yet. So I start looking into that one. So I'm still looking into some things and there are still people coming forward with some interesting information. Um, and I don't know if I'll ever be done, but I, I want to stick with it until it's resolved one way or the other, if I can. Thank you. Just fascinating. Thank you for sharing. 
Um, and we did receive a comment that our one of our guests finished the Bourbon King last night and really enjoyed it. So thanks for that. I'm toggling back and forth between chat and Q&A. Uh, a question for Janice. What do you do when you need information from a source or family member who does not want to speak to you? Well, all you can do is you might send them an email as opposed to just calling them. You might try to send them a letter. And then if they don't talk to you, then you can um, at least try to talk to people who know them. Um, that's not ideal because secondhand information is, is never, you know, as good. Um, but I, I did, um, in, in my book, I try to only kind of parachute in and give my own observations here and there. But there were a couple of times because I wasn't able to get Sarah Widmer's family to cooperate. Uh, I would, I kind of surmise that I, I, I can imagine that that wouldn't have sat well with Sarah's family, for example, you know, because if you're hearing that, your daughter's husband is looking at pornography um, and she's just a newlywed bride that I could just see where that would not probably wouldn't have sat well with them. And I, I think I conjectured a little bit on that. Um, but you're kind of stuck. Don't you agree, Bob, that if, if people don't want to talk to you, um, all you could do is talk to people who know them if they're willing to talk. A lot of times, if that person doesn't want to speak with you, they've also told all of their friends to shut it down, too. Um, you also can try social media. That's another thing. You can dig on social media and see if they have some publicly available things. That's a great resource nowadays. You can um, dig through any newspaper articles or um, sort Sources like that where maybe the person was quoted. Um, uh, there are records available that you can find biographical things about them. For example, I was able to find out about Sarah Widmer's dad having written a book and about his life a little bit from his obituary publicly available. Um, so it, it's a tough it's a tough thing when you when you have people who are not willing to cooperate and you're you're sort of stuck with what you have. Uh, Bob, an interesting question came in for you. Um, I've heard that George Remus inspired the character of Jay Gatsby. Could you speak to this as someone who's written about both? Yeah, that's a fantastic question and one that people often ask me. And I, what I'll tell you is that um, I love journalism and I consider myself a journalist to a great degree and, and Janice is a journalist, but sometimes journalists uh, are forced or, or cut corners. and over the years, over say about the last 20 or 25 years, people, particularly journalists, started saying that Remus, when they would mention him, was the, in capital letters, or emphasized model for Jay Gatsby. So that fascinated me since I've written a book, uh, really wrote a biography of the great Gatsby several years ago, and then wrote this book. So there is a long section in the book about the connection between Jay Gatsby and George Remus. I even went back and looked at everything I could find on uh, Fitzgerald, what papers he, newspapers he had access to, and I compared even what the newspaper said about Remus with what grew in um, Into the Great Gatsby and things like that. So. For, for example, if you think about what did, what did Jay Gatsby's pool look like, in The Great Gatsby, there are two lines, or really about two words that describe that. But we all, as individuals, because we've seen one of the movies, think of this grand uh, pool with sparkling jewels and all this kind of thing. So Remus's pool was like that, but that's not actually reflected in The Great Gatsby. So what I'm comfortable saying is that Remus was certainly a model for Jay Gatsby, but he was just one of several. Fitzgerald combined a number of bootleggers into the character Jay Gatsby. There are some very obvious um, similarities, like Remus's big thing was creating fake pharmacies. And if you've read The Great Gatsby, like I have 147 times, then that's obviously one of the things that comes bursting out. Now, I will say this at least a half dozen people told me that within, in the past, they went to the Seelbach Hotel in Louisville and they saw a photograph of Remus, Al Capone, Fitzgerald, and the mayor of Louisville in that bar. 
Now, I'm telling you that they didn't see that. That photograph does not exist. But if somebody finds that, you will have solved one of the great literary mysteries in American history. But a half a dozen, dozen people swore on a stack of Bibles that that picture exists. Now, the Seelbach talks about that. They don't have the actual proof, even though I love the Seelbach and I've spent great times there because my next book is on Rookwood Pottery, which will be out next month. And so I had to, I've spent a lot of time at the Seelbach, but there's no proof that Remus and Fitzgerald ever actually met in, per in person, as you will hear or read about if you look back in the record. Interesting, the Seelbach is an amazing place, that's for sure. Yes, yep. legendary. And librarians love primary evidence, so let's keep that conversation going. <laughs> uh, two more comments and questions came in, one for each of you. Um, I Google mapped the addresses provided in Bourbon King. Obviously, ma many building sites no longer exist. Would you, Bob, consider conducting a Bourbon King tour? <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> once, uh, once, you know, once we have a cure for this pandemic, I'm not going to rule anything out, uh, because I don't need to get out of the house. Uh, I, I would love to conduct a Bourbon King tour. I've had some discussions with the local, um, uh, the local tour companies and some of the people who run them and, and they're using my book, I believe, uh, you know, to further, further that cause because, I think, you know, I put the kind of research in, if you love Cincinnati and you love the 1920s, then you should read Bourbon King because the architecture of Cincinnati and the architecture of cities like Chicago and Cleveland, they are co-stars of the book. I'm a nut for architecture. And so I built that part of the book up and built up the stuff that I could find about Cincinnati and the great hotels. I mean, Cincinnati in the 1920s had at least two of the nice five nicest hotels in America. And um, I love that stuff. And it would be great to tour those areas. The Remus building, there was at one time the Remus building, a Remus building, it's, it, it's now a Bengals parking lot. So uh, the mansion was turned, torn down in 1934 in a Ponzi scheme. So it's gone. And um, a, a lot of this great heritage was just wiped away because people in Cincinnati wanted to be considered the second best city in America. And they were competing with Los Angeles and Washington DC and particularly Chicago. So they tried to whitewash the history and Remus from the history because they didn't want that black eye because it had been so famous in the 1920s. And unfortunately, Remus just slid into history's dustbin as a result. Thank you. And Janice, I, I realize this is a comment more than a question. Um, one of our guests says, I've read Submerged and it totally changed my mind. I knew he was guilty before reading the book. After reading it, I question Ryan's guilt. Your book is intriguing. Wow, well, thank you. My goal was to lay out all the relevant facts as best I could um, and let the reader make up his or her own mind. And um, it's, it's definitely been, an interesting process to receive feedback from people who did say they changed their mind. Some people said it didn't change their mind one way or the other. And I always, people ask me sometimes, oh, were you trying to you know, prove that he didn't do it? And I always tell people, I'm not an advocate for him. I'm an advocate for the truth, whatever that it might be. So um, thank you for the comment though. I appreciate that very, very much. And saying that, I have one burning question that I need to ask before we close. We have a couple minutes left, and I made sure there were, we answered all of our guests' questions. But this librarian is especially proud of our Cincinnati and Hamilton County Public Library because we have the print editions of historic newspapers going back to 1850 or even before. So in my career at the library, I've geeked out by just going through the area of 1930s or whatever, and the 80s is hilarious fun to go through, but pulled out actual bound newspapers and flipped through to kind of get a sense of the sociocultural history of the time. And one favorite project was looking at the day after the Titanic sank and the three or four days up to a week after and how many falsehoods there were in the day after and then the next day the falsehoods evolved into maybe some more truth. And I think you get the idea of what I'm saying. 
you both through this evening of Queen City Crime have referred to journalists covering your subject matter at the time of the trials, at the time of their lives, across the country and across the world. How many falsehoods did you see or how did that feel when you were closer to the facts of both of your cases? And Janice, I think you even mentioned some YouTube videos and some uh, local news reporting, of course. In a nutshell, how did other journalists' coverage frustrate you or impact you, that kind of thing? Did you see some sort of validity of truth in general or a lot of straying from the facts? I, I, I think that by and large, most of the coverage was accurate, um, but there were people who, for example, I know there was a, an intern from a TV station who kept saying incubate, incubation instead of intubation, as in terms of intubating Sarah Widmer. There were medical terms that this person clearly didn't understand. And the biggest frustration I had with it was that th there was live blogging going on in the court for, the, for like the first time that I was aware of. And when you're doing that, the potential for error is, is way higher because you don't have anybody say, uh, she didn't say incubation, it was intubation, and there's a big difference. <laughs> so there were things like that going on. Um, I do think that by and large, the information was accurate as it, it was unfolding in the court. Um, the hardest thing was just that there were certain people who would not speak to the media and, and still haven't to this day, so. Thank you. And I would say, uh, David, um, I'm not trying to kiss up too much, but I am a total nut for sources. And if you somehow at the Cincinnati Public Library had a way to pinpoint how much I am on the website doing research, you would fall over. Because I can tell you the access that I received through the Cincinnati Public Library for, to, to look at the Cincinnati Post online not only saved me six months of research, but may filled out the, the, the record of what Remus was doing because the Cincinnati Post so heavily covered the west side of Cleveland. And um, so I, I am a, a library nerd through and through, a source material through and through. And what I found with Remus was triangulating what truths I could pull out of multiple newspaper sources, multiple journalists, and Remus let some journalists in really close. Like he let um, uh, this guy Rogers in who wrote for the St. Louis Dispatch, uh, Post Dispatch, he let him in really close. So if you read his articles, you knew you were hearing the true Remus voice versus some others who would give uh, a more fanciful folklore kind of answer or, or kind of perspective. So um, I kind of triangulated the sources, looked at, at the, the court transcripts, looked at everything I could find, and then tried to provide what I thought through my analysis was the most thoughtful perspective on Remus. Because otherwise, um, like I said, you, you could write I, the Bourbon King could have been a ten could be a ten volume book easily. I could spend the rest of my life just writing about George Remus. Janice Heisel, Bob Batchelor, thank you so much for this evening of Queen City Crime. I know I've learned a lot, and to that, and thank you to our guests who were here tonight. Be sure and check out all the events recorded live and archived, um, like this one will be, um, so you can share this with friends and family and neighbors. Um, so keep an eye on the Ohioana Book Festival scheduled website. You'll see those archives as well. So thank you all for a wonderful evening of Queen City Crime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.